Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome SBI Podcast listeners and video podcast viewers. My name is Christina Dickmeyer and I'm the Director of Marketing at SBI, a sales and marketing company dedicated to helping you make your number. I am joined by my co-hosts, Mike Drapeau, partner at SBI, and Kevin Avery, senior consultant at SBI. This is the weekly show, and its purpose is to help you make your number as we debate some of the most pressing topics that senior executives are facing. Welcome to the show. Today's show is titled, Death of the Perfect Strategy, Mediocre Talent, and centers around talent strategy. We cover the topic of talent strategy in detail in our report, How to Make Your Number in 2016, specifically on pages 197 to 214, if you would like to follow along. So let's get started. One of the main goals of talent strategy is to place the right talent in the right performance conditions. Let's hone in on one of the particular area of the company, the sales organization. We recently had a conversation with one of our viewers, Beth, the senior human resources business partner to the sales department at a computer and network security company said, where can I find the best reps, the A players, if you will? Are they born that way? Or can anyone be an A player rep with development over time? Or is it a combination of the two? My take is that there's only a few natural A players and I just have to find them and keep them happy so they stay. It's hard work to locate and attract them. Kevin and Mike, what is your opinion on this? Is it nurture or nature? Oh boy, this is, uh, this is one you can go around hours and hours on and, and our audience will thank us that we're only gonna go a lot less than that. Um, <laughs> but I'll give you my views on, on the whole nature versus nurture argument, but uh, let me back up a step first. Um, you know, the problem in my view is the notion of an A player, it's twisted. Um, in any company, industry, market, there are A, B, and C players. No, no question about that. Uh, but there's no overarching universal definition of A player. Somebody didn't come out of the womb and, you know, with, with uh, A player stamped on their neck. Um, really, your strategy should define what an A player is to you. Um, informed by your market research is defined by your corporate and, and, and um, aligned functional strategies. Um, the other issue with this whole A player, na nature, nurture, that kind of thing is it's way too academic. Look, in practice, you have to balance need and economics, right? That's the practical reality. And to illustrate what I mean, let me, let me go back to when I was working in the call center world. There was an almost religious zeal about average speed of answer, so, or c average wait time if you want to be customer centric. But um, consider this. If you answer in 15 seconds and your customer gives you an A, staffing up to answer in five seconds is actually waste. And on the flip side, let's say that answering in 15 seconds gets you a B, but so would answering in 40 seconds. If a B is good enough, guess what you should do? And so there's an analog there to talent. You know, Kevin, I think uh, I would uh, quibble with you a little bit on the idea that the A player concept is twisted. What I would say is that the definition of an A player is very specific to a role and to a company. And there is almost an infinite number of A player definitions that you create. That's great. great and point. oftentimes people think that there is a profile for a sales rep, almost irrespective of an industry solution, product company, what have you. And that, that would be twisted. So I think in this case, Beth, who's writing into us, kind of knows um, what she's looking for with regard to a sales rep. She has some form of a, of a profile. So the, the question that she has to answer is, can I go find that ready-made talent to staff this quota-carrying, coin-operated sales rep, or can I go build people, either new hires to build them up, or maybe people in existing roles in the company, and then and I can, can I fleet them up? Can they become A players? So my, my, my answer to Beth is simply this. You can dive into the B pool if they have A player potential. So that's the issue. 100% of the Bs don't have A potential. So it, there is some uh, nature component to it, but you have to define what that, that A player potential looks like, okay? And so once you've done that, you can then separate the wheat from the chaff and begin your development program. So what are, what are three things that I would tell you that you can use to sort of the divining rod to separate the Bs on the left and to the A potentials on the right mm. so that you can have that, um, you can then begin making your hires into this new role, the sales rep role. The first is, can that person put in front of you the last three hiring managers they had? And will those three people tell you everything you want to know, right? So the uncle, the, um, the local minister, uh, the coach of the football team, none of them get to be, provide references. It's the last three managers. Are those people willing to take the time, effort, energy to be present for a detailed reference interview? It's actually a big tell. 
Number two, can you create a job trial? Is there some way for you to artificially create a situation, a scenario, which approximates what they're going to experience when they're a frontline sales rep. And it's actually a pretty sophisticated way to do it, but you can do it. So that that new person goes in and then demonstrates how they act in that cauldron of pressure called the moment of truth with the customer. That is a huge tell. And number three, um, do they, uh, uh, have they demonstrated an ability in the past to go from mediocre performer to excellent performer in another role? So it could be a professional role, could be a personal role, but have they shown that ability to amp up their game? Or have they always sort of been average? So you're looking for that directionality in, in the past before to show that they have the sacrifice tolerance level and the necessary um, uh, personal fortitude to become an A player in this new role. Yeah, that's a, that's a really that's a really good point. Uh, I think one of the things that we find that not just in sales, but uh, it's a particularly acute problem there, is that leaders have a tough time um, mixing up the idea of current capability versus capacity. And I think that's some of the things that Mark's getting getting at there. So I would uh, re you know really think about that going forward. You know, I'd like to tie this back because we talk a lot about strategic alignment. I like to we're, we're talking about sales A players. Um, we're talking about uh, the corporate strategy now. We're talking about uh, the talent strategy and how they come together and how they have to combine. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, there's a lot of people who are sometimes working near each other and not really helping each other. Um, but I want to go back to the corporate strategy and say, all right, what type of person? Now you're going to you're going to define the competencies and uh, and whatnot for for a particular role. But you can get a good bead on the sort of what level of person in your industry do you need based on what your strategy is. If your strategy is price, the required pr talents probably probably cost less because again you're less reliant on a very rare set of competencies. You know, if your strategy is product. You have a different issue and you have a narrower lens because the competencies you need are in shorter supply and they're of a certain ilk. Um, if you're winning with customer intimacy, again, you have a narrower lens and you have to be more selective, but it's a different sort of selectivity than if, you're, uh, if, if, you're, if you're, your win strategy is, pr is product. Um, so the, you, it, with a customer experience or customer intimacy strategy, um, you need people with what I would call a high LQ or likability quotient, mm -hmm. along with the other um, actual technical competencies and that kind of thing that your, your, your uh, talent research delineates. You know, you started off, Kevin, talking about the tie between talent strategy and corporate strategy, and I think that that's key. And just because of that tie alone, it should be enough to prevent anyone from sort of rushing into a hiring frenzy without calculating the consequences, but yet that they still do that. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of because the, the little devil on the, on the shoulder of many sales leaders is the one that says bad breath is better than no breath, right? <laughs> right? And it's actually not better. Um, it's worse. It's worse. And the, the way the sort of concept that I like to bring to the table to help bring that to life is the cost of mishire. So this is a calculation that you create when you sort of tally up all the bad things that occur and monetize them when a bad per when the when the wrong person gets into the into the role. What are the damage that they do? And you can imagine the standard things that go in there: uh, uh, severance costs, uh, recruitment costs for replacement, that sort of a thing. But also gets into opportunity costs. What is the what happen? What is the cost of not having the customer that you would have had? What happens to the cost in terms of damage to the territory through competitive inroads or maybe through bad reputation? Any number of things that happens when you get a real turkey in the role. So. My, my recommendation, strong one, is to Beth and others, is to calculate the cost of mishire in that role. And once you know it, then that'll make you more judicious and deliberate about staffing it. That's absolutely right. All right, Mike, let me wrap up this discussion with a little riff on nurture. Okay. Um, now, in my view, there is tremendous, often untapped potential for nurture. Um, I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, I think so. So... Um, what we find, though, is many companies these days are convinced that, and they uh, and they hire only experienced people from their industry, and they believe that's the only way to go. Folks, there's only so much A player talent out there in your industry. Um, you know, th people either believe that it's not possible to grow your own, um, or they don't know how, or they make excuses like things are moving too fast, so I need to go, you know, ra raid the chicken coop. Mm -hmm. um, but that's like saying I'm too busy to be organized. No, you're too busy not to be organized. Leaving aside the aging of the workforce challenge that we all are going to have, I mean, except for young people like us, mm -hmm. um, and the inbreeding problem for the moment, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, you scrape on the bottom of the barrel, 
It's a super high cost proposition because you're always competing for the top talent only in a very narrow place. And these people end up kind of going bump, bump, back and forth, back and forth. Yep. Um, and it just, you can wring yourself dry. Um, you know, you see a tendency to fall in love with people from competitors that you esteem too, um, instead of falling only in love with the right people irrespective of their current employer. And that comes down to, the, to getting that great competency profile. That is having Beth and people like her partnered with you so that you are building a profile of an A player that, for the role for your company based on your strategy. A strong talent program avoids all of these ills, uh, and that's a bigger topic we can probably cover in another show. Okay, let's do that. All right, great points by both of you. And here's how I would summarize it. What you need to grow your own is an aligned corporate strategy that focuses on a great sales strategy that knows exactly the talent it needs. It also needs to build the performance conditions required not only to support graybeards, but to purposely accommodate the pipeline of future A players and leaders. We also cover the topic of talent strategy extensively in the episodes of the SBI podcast. For example, we recently published an episode titled Case Study, Developing the Talent Strategy to Make Your Number Next Year, that I think our viewers will find helpful. Let's take a quick break and let our listeners know how to subscribe to the SBI podcast. We'll be right back. Do you have too many things to do and not enough time to do them? Is finding time to learn best practices almost impossible? The SBI podcast is your solution. Turn time spent exercising, commuting, and traveling into productive learning time with a subscription to the SBI podcast. SBI podcast listeners get unique insight into real world sales and marketing issues through interviews with your industry peers every week. Find us on iTunes by searching for Sales Benchmark Index Podcast and subscribe today. Welcome back. My name is Christina Dickmeyer and I'm here with my co-hosts, Mike Drapeau and Kevin Avery for today's show, Death of a Perfect Strategy, Mediocre Talent. Before the break, Mike and Kevin shared with us their opinions on whether A players are born or made. Let's dig into this a little deeper and look specifically at talent programs. Dave, an HR manager at an information technology company, recently told us, most of the baggage that comes with talent development, assessments, competencies, individual development plans, onboarding programs, et cetera, is fluff and wasted time. It seems to me to be a program for the sake of having one and does not drive a business result. What am I missing? I've heard this from more than one person, and it usually goes hand in hand with the comment that all that matters is having good managers. They carry the load of coaching and training rather than having a formal program. Kevin and Mike, what do you see out there? Well, Christina, here's what I see. The reason executives are dubious is that there are really so, so few good programs out there. Why is that? Well, it's not because HR leaders are sort of mentally deficient. They're not. <laughs> the, the, the strategic misalignment, which seems to exist in many, in many of the companies out there, makes it almost impossible for them to be successful, to create the right programs, to, to, right. to support, to enable. And it's not only their fault. It's the fault of either the CEO or potentially other functional leaders who will not let them into the decision-making consensus. So for, a, for the leader of the talent strategy, they have to have, if you will, the seat at the table to be able to both receive and understand the need to support the multidisciplinary cross-functional alignment and also to let them uh, understand what the limitations are so they don't design a strategy which assumes that 73 people are going to be hired in the course of one week to be able to execute their, what they have planned. Yeah, uh, never have I seen a dichotomy as wide mm -hmm. as from level five sales leaders um, to the sort of average sales leaders. Um, and this doesn't just sales leaders, it's others as well, but we see it especially, it's especially acute in sales. Um, no, nowhere is the HR leader, a talented HR leader, more esteemed um, than by a level five aligned leader. They get what the d deal is. But it's, as we know, those are rare companies. And it's not that these enlightened executives don't exist on the chain, mm -hmm. but a lot of these misaligned companies have given HR leaders an impossible task, do miracles, read my mind, yep. uh, et cetera. And so you get predictable results. So um, the, the, taking off from there, it's, you know, we talk about talent strategy, you know, that's fluff, whatever. Um, no, actually, a talent program needs to have teeth in it, and it needs to have really definable teeth in it. And the conventional wisdom out there is that it's just this, you know, 
thing on a PowerPoint slide. Yep. But you know, you've got some depth there when you really have a, a strong talent strategy. It covers sourcing and recruiting mm -hmm. to cast a wide net at the perfect school of fish. Not just a wide net for any fish, right? Because uh, you get stink fish then. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it, it's got to have a, a, an onboarding program because a quality onboarding program shortens the ramp to uh, to um, to uh, full productivity, and it also drives up retention. Interestingly enough, mm -hmm. um, you have to have uh, you have to have professional development that is tuned to the to the roles, um, and therefore you have to have the competencies and that kind of thing defined, et cetera, what you're trying to build, and you have to have succession planning. And to your point, Mike, so few of the quote unquote talent programs out there really have anything other than window dressing. So I'm, I'm going to have to violently agree with you there. And I ask myself, what does a good recruiting and sourcing program look like? And getting back to the, the earlier questions, which is how do I go wade in and find those, those A players? Well, one way is to avoid sort of scraping the bottom of the barrel of your industry is to go into another industry. Well, how do you know what you're getting? How do I know that my, my cup of tea is the right one there? Well, you use a set of competencies that are highly custom to the role, not just generic competencies that fit 47 other companies, but your, comp your competencies customized to your company and your role. And then you test for that so that you give yourself the level of confidence you need along with a, com a companion set of accountabilities so that you can kind of measure on an on a XY graph whether or not a net new person from a different industry potentially might be the A player that you seek. Yeah, you know, if you think about it, we talked about sources of advantage, um, proprietary knowledge. If you take the trouble to align with your HR leader, you get an opportunity to build proprietary knowledge and hone that over time about what the true A player is for you, for your company specifically, and all its advantages and weaknesses and things like that versus a generic profile. Um, you know, I think that's really underappreciated. Now, evidence is thick on the ground, too. Um, in most organizations, one of the root causes of some of the talent issues is role corruption. So we see this especially in sales. So you think you have a talent problem, but you actually have role corruption. You have people who are doing jobs that they weren't hired for, they're probably not qualified for, um, and yet because they're doing it, the presumption is that A, this is, you know, this is what it is, and B, it's as good as it can be. Um, and you can trace this sort of fallacy uh, back to flaws in corporate strategy. Um, like poor market segmentation, flaws in product strategy like false differentiation, flaws in sales strategy like a mixed bag org structure combining, um, like a Franken structure combining <laughs> four or more of the six structures. And you know, research has shown that that is just a recipe for disaster. A Franken org. You, you know, I, I want to you know, go back and pick up one point you mentioned was onboarding, and this is a this is an area where I kind of have a theory of the converted view, <laughs> and I run onboarding for SBI and have, and have done led several projects for for our clients. It is one area which almost uniformly weak, and it's it's a crime because it's the it's the first stop, it's the first experience a net new employee has, or maybe a net new person in a, in a company to a new role, and they're often so flaccid, and so I say to myself. If any of you out there are running onboarding programs and, and want to get out the checklist that I love to do, I want to give you some items and get yours out and say, is this, do I suffer from this in my onboarding plan? If so, please correct it. So does it, your onboarding program look like this? Is it a series of administrative events, maybe a, a, a one-week company orientation session? Uh, is it largely product-centric training? Intermixed with maybe some IT and HR checkboxes, you know, getting your key to the bathroom and so forth. Is it very ad hoc? Do the managers not really have a role? Is there no capability for self-service of it? Do the managers have no accountability for the onboarding process? That's a huge Achilles heel to most onboarding programs. Um, is, are there no interim milestones? Do they not have a program that goes from shadowing to mentored or to coached interactions to then the set of interactions that individuals conducting on their own as they kind of they, they, they migrate along the path of competency in a role? Um, does the company think of uh, the cost of failed hires as nothing other than as the recruiting costs in the past? Is there sort of an a, inevitability and acceptance to churn? If these are aspects of your onboarding program, it's time to push the red stop button and to really develop a be emerging best practices capability in that regard. Yeah, this is a really well-entrenched bias. Um, people just assume that onboarding is baloney or whatever. And you know, managers do have a role, Mike, mm -hmm. in most corporations. Managers, your job is 
everything. <laughs> um, and of course, when your job is everything, your job is nothing, you are set up to fail. And so that really exacts a cost on your employees. So, um, you know, have you people you know, in the audience maybe suspend disbelief a little bit and let's talk a little bit about what good onboarding looks like. Um, you know, first of all, it's immersion in the company and the culture and that's only done through purposeful daily, weekly, monthly cadence. And that, that cadence is gonna be as appropriate for the role, um, which means that it has to be customized and configured by role, which means it has to be a deliberate design effort. You gotta have a talented HR leader and, the, and, and he or she has to understand the strategy um, for what you're trying to accomplish. Otherwise, they're shooting in the dark. Um, you know, you also need a series of sort of behavioral and leading um, ramp indicators and milestones and, uh, and being ready and anticipating problems and, and being ready to have course corrections. If you don't, you, you deserve what you get. Um, you know, ramp to full run rate productivity um, typically, depending on role, is three to nine months based on the complexi complexity of the role. Inside sales is lower, maybe field sales is middle, maybe a global account is, is up, you know, the nine to 12. Um, and there's a high correlation, it turns out, between hitting that off-ramp milestone mm -hmm. and making the goal for the next three years. Um, I don't think we have a statistically significant sample size but we're thinking in the 80% range, and if I'm off by you know, even a pretty sizable amount, that's huge. Yeah. So higher rates of retention, especially in cutthroat industries, like early stage uh, high tech companies, I mean, that's worth its weight in gold. You know, let me finish up with this point. Um, I think back to our uh, Make the Number in 2016 report and how we bring to life the concept of customer acquisition cost and lifetime value, and yep. we weave them together as sort of the the, the support of the, of the corporate strategy and how it defines what the good things that happen as you move from level one to level five. I'd like to make for the, for the HR leader a, a corollary to the talent strategy, which is that hiring costs and lost salary are like the CAC, the customer acquisition costs of HR. And um, the- That's a great point. Yeah, so it, it, the, the lost revenue, the missed opportunity, the lost customer, that's like the lifetime value that isn't attained again, at an HR level. So when you, when you boil it down this way, you start to realize, holy cow, the, the, a bad hire is, you know, is, you never see the iceberg that sunk you, right? right? So because, and that's the, what's b below the surface is the giant missed opportunity. And we're, people are people. We have, we're easy to spot the threat that we can see and not nearly as sensitive to one that's mm -hmm. much, looming much larger that we can't. And so this is why we feel so passionate about this with regard to the HR leaders. Yes, to expand on that, um, it, for those of you who haven't yet read the research and started to use the workbook, one of the things you'll find is some statistics on the benefits that accrue. It's again, it's the good type of double whammy um, because um, as you climb the ladder, your, cust your customer acquisition costs drop. And, it, and more importantly, maybe even, your lifetime value rises because you retain, you retain more customers and you churn them less often. All right, great po points by both sides. We can agree that a good talent strategy starts with strategic alignment. Then and only then can the HR team create a strategy and talent program that supports the talent needs of the other revenue generating functions, particularly sales. There's another resource that I wanna point out to our audience, SBI TV. We tackle topics like talent strategy and how to build a team of A players in episodes such as how a chief revenue officer of a billion dollar company builds his sales team. Let's take a short break and direct everybody to subscribe to SBI TV and then we'll be right back. You are watching SBI TV. This is a monthly web TV show featuring guests just like you, executives trying to grow their revenues. Each month, you can peek behind the scenes and watch your peers discuss their strategies for how they make their numbers. You are not going to want to miss this. Dickmeyer and I'm here with my co-hosts Mike Trapeau and Kevin Avery for today's show, Death of the Perfect Strategy, Mediocre Talent. Today we are talking about talent strategy and in our third segment, let's debate talent versus performance conditions in sales. 
Sarah, the VP of HR at a telecommunications company, asks, can you overcome any shortcomings in performance conditions with the right talent and charismatic leadership? Kevin and Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, the first thing, the only thing I'll say about charismatic leadership is that it's oversubscribed. Um, you know, I think under the right conditions, it's a bonus. Uh, because it's really about getting people to you know, self-sacrifice and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, what are the right conditions? Um, to me, a good sales strategy that aligns with policies, resources, tactics, uh, and that simplify execution. For me, the sales guy helped me make more money. Uh, that's the right conditions. Um, now, if I have those right conditions, and I'm a sales guy, and again, this could be anybody in the company, I'm picking on sales, um, but you know, you can be Casper, Casper Milk Toast, and I'll run through a wall for you. And without that, even if your charisma is truly grounded in authenticity, which is fairly rare, <laughs> well, maybe not that rare, um, but I'll end up thinking of you as tall hat, no cattle. Um, you know, okay, to, to oversimplify a bit, if you put great talent into lousy performance conditions, you'll get lower performance and higher turnover. If you invest in great performance conditions but undershoot the talent required to drive your Ferrari, mm -hmm. you'll still fail. Uh, so let's ground ourselves. Um, the first thing is that there is absolutely no excuse for poor performance conditions. Come on, man, it's the one thing that you control. Um, any level of talent you put into substandard performance conditions will underperform. But the conventional wisdom out there says that this is really a trivial issue. It's just not. And it's, it's like the fruit that's lying there on the ground. You didn't have to get up and pick it out of the trees. Uh, since you control the performance conditions, no excuses. Yeah, so I think Kevin has stumbled onto something here, something I would share with Sarah, and that I'm is constantly that- Constantly stumbling. Yeah, <laughs> constantly stumbling. The key concept is sequence. So you know, of course you need both great talent and, and optimal performance conditions. But uh, you need the better performance conditions first. And, and that is so when you bring talent in, that talent doesn't become uh, disgusted. It become, it, it, they don't uh, end up forcing themselves to create their own unique performance conditions that are local to their, to their environment. Uh, you don't end up with sort of that revolving door as they come in and they um, and they leave because it wasn't as you said it was going to be. They don't. You don't have to pay extraordinarily higher amounts to attract them because you're now bringing them into what amounts to a dysfunctional environment. All those things are reason to attack the performance conditions first. So improve those internal capabilities, improve the processes, the sales processes and other processes, improve your quality of automation, improve the integration you have with the marketing, improve the segmentation, get those going at least in the right direction, set them sales so you can paint a, a clear picture of where the company is going and you have confidence it's going to get there. And then while you're doing that, by the way, you can assess the talent. You can actually look at who's out there, maybe find a couple hidden gems that have been encrusted by whatever situation they're in. And you don't have to make all the moves right away, but you can get great situational awareness so that when the performance conditions begin to recover, now you can begin to bring in the A-player talent that you've found. Yeah, you know, and uh, there's a bias in the market. Um, everybody, the, the, you know, the sexy, shiny object is A-players. Yeah. Um, and creating performance conditions Boring, yeah. right? And, and then there, some CEOs, some heads of sales, you know who you are out there. You don't believe that that, that really matters. Um, but the research says it does. Um, just try it. The, um, so, but I mean, ultimately you have to decide whether to, to, to invest incremental dollars in creating better performance conditions or upgrading the talent. Like I said, conventional wisdom is upgrade the talent. Usually you have lousy performance conditions or at least room for improvement. And Mike, you've highlighted that. Sequencing is important. Mm -hmm. um, you look, performance conditions and talent can, to some extent, be substituted, make up for shortcomings in, in, in each other. We talk about them being 50-50, but that's obviously a, a, not a strictly literal. It's shorthand for saying that they have to be in balance according to your strategy. So how do you know what the balance is? Uh, the answer can be found in your corporate strategy, which again informs both sales and talent strategies. Thinking about trade-offs, I'm going to riff on strategy author Richard Rummelt. You know, he 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 gave the, he painted this picture. Of these you know, and I, I, this is a little bit different than the, his exact thing, but he said if, if you need to make 10,000 bologna sandwiches, um, 100 fast food cooks is going to beat one Michelin three three star chef, right? <laughs> but if you or I needed to produce a gourmet meal to save our lives, uh, I think you know who you're going to hire. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's that ability to substitute is has got limitations. So you need to understand the requirements of your strategy. Um, now, is higher talent level always better? 
Of course it is, but that's such a simplistic, easy answer. Yeah. Um, and you know, the CFOs out in the crowd are probably going to stand and cheer here um, because you know it's just not always worth paying for. Jeffrey Moore's concept, you know, Jeffrey Moore is uh, crossing the chasm and dealing with Darwin. Brilliant guy. Had an opportunity to work with him uh, in the past, and and just one of the smartest and nicest people I've ever met. He has this concept called core versus context. And it, simply put, core is what drives differentiation. Context is everything else. So customers will reward excellence in core with a price premium, uh, but not core. So to the extent the talent is core, it drives differentiation. Like if, you're, if your uh, strategy is customer intimacy, not price, um, then you invest in it more. Uh, if it's less a differentiator, you know you alloy good enough talent to solid performance conditions and then you'll maximize profitable revenue. Well, thanks, Kevin. What I, I tell you what, in thinking about all this, I brought this book along. I would be remiss at this, at this point if I didn't mention Top Grading for Sales, a book written by our CEO, Greg Alexander, which is really a field manual of how, when, and why to improve the sales talent profile of your firm. And there's a lot that's discussed in this book, but one of the things that he covers is how to go about assembling that profile. We've talked about the A-player profile. We've possibly even beaten that concept to death, but what we haven't, <laughs> what we haven't done is actually help uh, poor Sarah understand what to actually do. How do I crank that profile out so that I know that when I go hunting, I'm going to find the right uh, I'm going to find the right person. So that's a cookbook. Yeah. So often I've seen time and time again. Uh, a boilerplate profile. I mean, it's like the thing gets handed around the industry and everybody's using the same one and they just swap the logos out. So that, that would not be the approach that Greg recommends. So what I wanted to capture is some of the components of a profile. So if you can go back to your profiles, break them open and see, do they have these things? Well, the first would be the strategic value of the role to the company. If it's important enough for you to do the role definition, it's important enough for you to say to yourself, what it, why is this role important to the company? Specifically, again, that helps you with alignment with that role inside of the, the functional strategy that it's in. Number two, what are the core competencies and the unique competencies that are needed to be an A-player in that role? And how do those competencies manifest themselves? I can't just say something like leadership. That's way too generic. It's right. got to be super specific. And then what is the difference between an A and a B and a C player inside of that competency? Right. That's so the manager can pattern match and know, is this person A, B, or C? What are the metrics of accountability for the role? How do I know that role is performing well? And not just the comp plan, that's just the things you're paying them on, but there's a much greater than that, the, the artifacts of sales performance management. What's a detailed description of this role does? So often, a job profile will say, here's the background you have to have, you know, right. 10 years in business and college degree and whatever else. But what is this person doing? What is their, what is their cadence? What is their, what is, what is their calendar look like? that helps you make sure that you're attracting the right person. That person, that right person is attracted to the role. And then the, the, what is the description of the territory? Can you imagine that there's sales, there's sales rep job roles that go out with any, without any description of what the territory looks like? How many sales reps, usually B players, will take a job not knowing what their territory is like? And then, holy cow, they're, they're frustrated and surprised when the territory isn't what they thought it might be. Right. A players never do that. A players say, I need to see exactly what my territory looks like. What are the customers? What are the prospects? What does the pipeline look like? And then I'm going to match that with what, what, what I know and what I'm able to deliver. And then I'll see whether or not this is a good fit for me. That's when you know you have an A player. And they don't tell you that's why they, they blew you off, um, but that's why they blew you off. Yeah. You no, think it's something else, like we didn't pay enough or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> no territory is no job for me. Yeah. Exactly. So right. to return to Sarah's question, I would say you can overcome poor performance conditions with Herculean efforts of A players, but only for a short period of time yeah. before they become disgruntled and they leave. So what you need to do is get going ASAP on improving those performance conditions while you assess your staff so that you can get ready for uh, combining talent and performance conditions together. All right. Thanks, Kevin and Mike. I think you guys summed it up well. You must have both good performance conditions and good talent. You must fix the conditions before bringing in new talent. We're going to take one more break and point our audience to the SBI's blog. We talk about talent quite a bit on our blog in articles such as why talent is the final link to making your number. When we come back, we'll wrap up today's debate. Each day, you receive hundreds of emails, tons of text messages, countless telephone calls, and sit in too many meetings. How do you find ideas to make the number with all this noise? 
the SBI blog filters all this nonsense for you and presents only first-rate ideas to make the number. Simplify your life. Subscribe to one blog and read the best content. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com and subscribe today. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying today's show, Death of a Perfect Strategy, Mediocre Talent. Mike and Kevin, thanks so much for sharing your opinions today. Our audience has benefited greatly. If you want to make sure you have a deep understanding of talent strategy and why it's important, get a copy of this year's research report called How to Make Your Number in 2016 at www.salesbenchmarkindex.com slash 2016 hyphen report. If you want to take it a step further, you can have one of our experts lead you through a workshop which will detail how to do this. Go to www.salesbenchmarkindex.com slash 2016 hyphen workshop. And finally, I want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in. For myself, Kevin, and Mike, we wish you much success as you try and make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.